what's called street photography, which basically is, I mean, just what it sounds, going out on the streets, taking pictures of people that you come in contact with. What draws me to uh, that particular type of photography is just the candid nature of it. I don't like uh, posed images. I like to get a, a feel for how people, you know, go about their normal life. Um, on the streets, I like candid, I uh, like to see them in their natural environment. That's the sort of photographs that I am drawn to uh, look at when I'm looking at photography. It's also the sort of, uh, sort of photography that I love to take myself. Um, because I'm so fascinated by the candidness of it, it's sort of natural that I'm drawn a lot to kids because they have, they're they not self-conscious, um, you know, they live freely, do whatever they want, uh, and they're not too intimidated by uh, someone having a camera in their face, so you get to see a lot of, you know, just, just naturally how they are. And um, that sort of leads me to this particular project. Um, I went to Haiti in 2011 with the St. Michelle Foundation, and they are a foundation that was started by a woman named Ansi Blow. She is of Haitian descent. She's a retired nurse, and she goes back to Haiti throughout the year to uh, for uh, medical um, assistance to offer her expertise and just sort of lend a helping hand, and also to visit family when she gets a chance. Um, she sort of adopted a particular school in a city called Tomazo. And the name of the school is St. Michelle, hence the name St. Michelle Foundation. And basically, she is their guardian angel. She provides them with books, with uniforms, uh, food, you know, all those sorts of things. And she does that continuously throughout the year. But every December, a group goes down to basically put on a holiday celebration for the kids because it's not something that they're able to experience, you know, otherwise, a lot of these children. And so um, that's, that's when I went down with her in December of 2011. Um, it was about a year after the earthquake. And so I basically just want to show you some of the uh, photographs that I took while I was there, sort of, um, I guess you can retroactively take a trip to Haiti with me, and uh, you can sort of see it through my eyes and, and what I saw. Uh, we arrived in Port-au-Prince, which is the capital of Haiti, and even though we arrived a year after the earthquake, you would think that it had just hit. When, as soon as you get off out of the airport, this is what greets you. This was once a very majestic government building, um, as you can see, it was pretty much destroyed during the earthquake. Here's a close-up of one of the windows. And, you know, all of the rubble and everything's still there as it is. It was never fixed. And really, I mean, there's no, there's no money to repair it. And um, obviously, it's, it's no longer in use. It just sort of sits there. Right? I mean, it, it's what greets you as soon as you enter the country. So it's, it's just a real smack in the face. Um, of, it's a reality check, basically of what happened. Um, these are armed guards that are protecting one of the uh, UN mission. You can see, you know, obviously there's a lot of aid organizations that go to Haiti to try and offer help, food, you know, medical assistance, that sort of thing. And in Port-au-Prince, where this was taken, it's still a very dangerous city. And so, um, and people are hungry, you know? And so if a truck is driving around with tons of food in it, uh, it basically needs to be protected because uh, there's a very good chance that you know, people may overtake it and, and, and uh, take the food. So yeah, there are armed guards, you, you'll see them. At first it's very jarring when you go just to see uh, officials in the streets and everywhere else with these big machine guns, but you sort of get used to it as, as, you, uh, as you're there a little while. It's pretty commonplace. Um, this is, was taken in Tent City. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Tent City. It is basically a city of tents. After the, her after the earthquake, um, there were millions of displaced people, people with no homes um, and, and no way of, of getting 
the shelter besides setting up these tents and, and living living in them. A tent city is also right outside of the airport. So as, as soon as you step outside the airport, this, you know, it's, it's a very, it's hard to imagine, but it's an extremely huge area of just tents and thousands of people living there uh, with no running water, no um, electricity, obviously, and you know they just make do the best that they can. This is this is a woman outside of her home, um, cleaning up and collecting water. That's uh, a little boy just uh, sort of hanging out. Side, um, in a courtyard, uh, a, a makeshift courtyard in Tent City. That's a little girl standing outside. That's uh, for uh, for her, that's her front door. And so she's standing outside of her front door, which is this tent, giving the thumbs up. Um, we explored Port-au-Prince for quite some time, uh, driving around and walking around, and it's a pretty, bustling city, um, even though they, they're, there's not a lot there post-earthquake, there's still a lot of activity going on, you know, a lot of people just going on with their daily lives as best they can. And this is just an example of a street scene of uh, some people sort of hanging out. You'll see a lot of people carrying these huge loads on their head, and you wonder how on earth they're, they're able to balance. They carry laundry, food, personal effects, all in their head. I, I, I don't know how they do it. These women are holding it, but you'll see a lot of them not holding it all. They're somehow balanced. And it starts off from when they're kids. They learn how to do it um, at a very, very young age. So by the time they are adults, they're pretty much pros at it. Here's another example of a woman just going about her day carrying a load on her head. This is uh, a little boy carrying jugs of water back home. It's amazing how many people, millions of people are living with no running water. And so it's, it's a constant theme that you'll see uh, people, and for some reason, I'm not sure exactly why, I guess maybe it's just children's uh, chore, uh, but a lot of times it will be children carrying these buckets of water home, you know, for washing off, to drink, you know, and everything else that you need water for. Here's an example of uh, some little kids, other little kids carrying water home. There, on the streets of Port-au-Prince, there's a lot of selling of food. There are not too many supermarkets there, and so, <laughs> Um, basically, the streets are where you, for the most part, where you uh, eat your food. You know, here's an example of a scene of uh, some local women selling bananas out on the street, and some people sort of haggling, haggling down the price, and, and uh, that's where they get their fresh food from. Uh, live chickens, you'll see quite often on the street. Those are also sold for food. This is a man. Um, standing by his uh, chicken coops, making sure that no one takes off with, with his uh, chickens. Um, but he, he sells them, you know, every day that, that's, that's what he does, collects them and sells them on the street. Uh, another example of a woman doing the same. This man uh, just bought dinner, and he's taking it home. Uh, yeah, to, to cook and eat. Uh, again, this is just an example of how crazy it can get in Port-au-Prince. Uh, this is at a gas station, and just something as simple as stopping to get gas it can be tricky <laughs> and a little dangerous, and so a lot of the, the uh, owners of these gas stations will hire armed guards to protect their customers as they, as they come and fill up. This street is, this is one of the back streets that we sort of wandered down, um, and as you can see, it's pretty hectic, and it, it's, there's a lot of sewage, garbage, just open on the streets, and, you know, there, there's no system set up within the government to take care of it, 
So, you know, everything is just sort of tossed and, and, and there's no one there to clean up. One of the most heartbreaking scenes that I saw throughout my whole trip was on this street. And uh, it was of a man who, I don't know if he was uh, born this way or if he was an amputee or what, but he um, had no legs. He, he I, for like, uh, he's amputated from the waist down. And he, I saw him, you know, he was down there in the muck, in the dirt, with his hands right in the middle of it, you know, going from point A to point B. And I, I couldn't bring myself to take a picture of him. I, I just couldn't do it. But it, it, it really broke my heart. I mean, in this scene, I don't think we even got out of the car on this street. I mean, it was really that bad, that filthy. And just to see anyone even walking amongst uh, this grime was sort of shocking. But to see this man just so down in it, it, it just, um, I don't know, it, it broke my heart. And again, I, I just couldn't take a picture of him. But, you know, this is an example of, there are many streets like this in the city of Port-au-Prince, and, um, you know, it, I just don't know how, how people uh, sort of navigate and live in this sort of environment on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is a scene um, in Tomaso, which is very, very different from the city of Port-au-Prince. Port-au-Prince is an urban environment in the country of Haiti. Tonazo is uh, out in the countryside. And so you see a lot of the same um, poverty and um, you know want, but it's in a much nicer, fresher environment. And so you can tell that the, the, uh, people are a little happier, a little quicker to smile, that sort of thing. Um, and you see the mountains in the back. I mean, it's really beautiful. Haiti's actually a really, really beautiful country. The, you know, the, the natural environment of it is really beautiful. This is a scene from um, the St. Michelle School that I told you about earlier. This is uh, their courtyard. So uh, this is where the kids go out to play, um, where they enter and exit the facility, uh, and that's their view from the school. Um, the school itself is really just a cinder block shell. There, there's really nothing else to it. Um, you know, there are no benches, there are no uh, pretty uh, pictures on the wall, no, nothing to stimulate, mentally stimulate these kids. Um, so, you know, this is an example of one of the volunteers trying to liven up the place a bit for the holidays. She, she's just uh, stringing out some Christmas lights, just trying to give it a festive feel. This is um, the principal of St. Michelle School with his son. And about a year before uh, I went down and, and, uh, and met him, he had lost his wife. Uh, she died in childbirth. And he was left to take care of four young children himself. So he takes care of these children himself. He runs a school. Uh, he's a very, very busy man. but. Um, you know, he, he, he does it with a smile on his face, and he was very welcoming and accommodating to us. This is an image of the auditorium. It, it, it doubles as a church chapel and a, and a school auditorium. Um, these, this is right before the children sang us a, a welcome and thank you song. It was really beautiful. Um, you know, they just wanted to express their thanks for everything that we were uh, going down there to do. And, and what we did basically is put on a Christmas celebration for them. So we handed out presents. Um, Santa came. We gave them, uh, you know, and this, and this was more than likely the only Christmas present that they were going to have that year. Uh, we had food and drinks for them. Um, and so they were very, very excited to see us. Uh, and we were excited to see them, of course. And like I said, they sang us this really beautiful song of things. I couldn't understand everything that they were saying. I had to get it translated, but it, it was really beautiful. And this is right before they did that. This is a little girl waiting her turn. Uh, or she, she just got her present from Santa. She was very excited. Um, 
another little girl who just got a present. You can see Santa a little bit there. Um, the most popular present for the boys <coughs> by far were the footballs, or what we call soccer balls. Um, I mean, they went nuts over these soccer balls. These boys did. A fight broke out, actually. <laughs> and the teachers sort of had to separate them, calm everyone down. But those uh, footballs are prized possessions in, in Haiti. And, uh, you know, we took down stacks and stacks of presents, but um, they ran out so we couldn't give everyone a present, which was really upsetting. Um, and of course, not every, everyone got a soccer ball. So the, uh, the soccer ball thing was a big, big deal. And um, I know next time, uh, Ms. Blow, who's the head of the foundation, went down with more than enough so that that uh, would not happen again. This is just an example of uh, the kids just eating and enjoying uh, the meal that we provided them. They, uh, a lot of them, you know, this was, the only thing that they get to eat throughout the day is, you know, meals provided by the by the school. You know, they only get to eat at <coughs> school, and so of course they're very excited to to uh, try that. These students, uh, they don't have much at all. They don't have much um, in their home life. They don't have much. Um, you know, the school facility itself doesn't really have too much to offer them. But they, they're so happy, joyful, they appreciate everything. Um, and you know, they're just like regular kids. They jump around, laugh, play, and have a good time. And so it was really, it was really nice to see that example of them. So they love to get their pictures taken. <laughs> so they were always like showing their face in the camera trying to, trying to get, and they wanted to always see, it was a digital camera, so I always had to turn around and say, see, here you go. I also um, sent some pictures back to uh, Mrs. Lowe, back to the school, and so uh, they could uh, actually have prints of themselves and stuff. And I was told a lot of them, um, their parents hung, up, hung it up in their house. So that was nice. This little boy, he wanted to uh, put on a musical presentation for his fellow students. And um, this is him sort of playing, playing the drums. That was a drum that his grandfather made. And so he's very proud of it, as he should be. And he played a nice little song for everyone. This girl has a special place in my heart. She, her name is Marceline. And she took to me for some reason. She followed me around everywhere I went, um, saying, through a translator, I, I understood, saying really beautiful things and sweet things to me and, and asking if she could help in any way, that sort of thing. Um, they told us not to, um, outside of the food and, and beverages that were provided to the kids um, inside of the school, they told us not to dig into our personal stash to give any of the kids, just because they didn't want um, one kid saying, oh, I got this, and then, you know, people, kids feeling left out, that sort of thing. And so, you know, I tried to stand by that rule as best I could, but I broke it one time for her. Um, I tried to give her, uh, like, uh, I had like fruit juices, I had Cokes, and all those sorts of things. She didn't want any of it, and all she wanted was bottled water. When she saw the bottled water, I mean, I've never seen a smile so big before in my life. It just, it really touched me, and it, and, it, and it really drove home the fact that we take so much for granted here. Something as simple as water, you know, that all we do is turn on the faucet and they come so freely and, and you know, these kids are walking miles to bring water home. This little girl, um, you know, I made her day simply by giving her a bottle of water. Um, while we were in Tomaso, we also visited several orphanages, and this is a shot of some children at the Kai, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, but the Cayenne Orphanage. Um, the orphanages were tough. They really were. And, um, you know, you walk in and you see these conditions that these kids are living in, and, and you have to, to sort of put your emotions on the back burner because 
They don't want to see that. You know, they don't. They don't want you to feel sorry for them. They don't want you uh, tearing up, and and you know, they want to smile on your face. They want to interact with you. You know, all these kids really. They they just wanted some personal interaction in a positive way. Um, they wanted us to play football with them, basketball. The younger kids wanted us to pick them up. Uh, they wanted hugs. They wanted you to hold their hand as you walked with them. They really just wanted personal, they wanted to be touched and wanted personal interaction because, you know, these are children whose parents, you know, were, were killed in the earthquake. Um, the staff is outnumbered by like 100 to 1, and they don't get a lot of, of personal interaction on a day to day basis. And so they're, I feel as though they were starving for the, for, the, for our touch and our presence more than they were for food, really. Um, this is just a shot of a bag of rice that a, uh, one of the um, NGOs left with, with the uh, orphanage. You know, a lot of, a lot of um, the food uh, comes from outside of the country, obviously. So, uh, you know, the U.S. is a big contributor, not the U.S. government, but the U.S. organizations are large contributors of food and, you know, other sustenance for the orphanages. Um, this little boy, the one on the bottom right, he somehow taught himself how to grow and cultivate these shallots, and he, that was his job. You know, he took great pride in that. He loved the fact that he was helping to feed everyone else. And, and, he, and he said to me that he wanted, he, he appreciated what everyone else was doing for, for him and, you know, the other children there. But he wanted, he wanted Haitians to feed Haitians, is what, was what he said. And so he, he just, like I said, just took very great pride in, in doing that. That's him with his, uh, with his shouts. And he said he wants to grow up and be a farmer and feed his people for the rest of his life, he said. Um, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to be uh, in Haiti during um, a time when they brought almost all of the orphans from around the country to one huge site for a huge celebration. Um, there was music and food and, you know, a lot of these kids, this is like the one shining day where they're able to just sort of forget about their circumstances and have fun and, you know, you see they have balloons and stickers and they just had a really good time. Um, these are our young girls at the celebration too, just smiling, laughing and having fun, you know? Um, When, before I before I got to Haiti, I you know only knew about what was in the news, you know it, what you hear about the poverty, you know the desperation and, and those sorts of things. And for sure, you see that when you, when you get there. But what really stuck with me was the spirit of the Haitian people. Somehow they are, they are able to rise up beyond their circumstances, and there's just a certain amount of um, dignity that they still possess, self-possession, pride, and, they, and there's a lot of fight in them, which was really inspiring to me. And, you know, you just, it makes you stop and think, you know, what do I have to complain about, you know? You know, if these people can find joy and laughter, you know, in their desperate circumstances, you, why, why am I upset, or why am I sad, or, or complaining about this or that? You know, it's just, it's just very inspiring, and, and they have a lot to teach us, I think. Um, and, and one of the main things I sort of learned was to live in the present. They, they weren't always concerned about, okay, you know, I live in a tent, I don't have a home. While they're in front of friends, face to face, they laugh, and, and you see their spirit come through, and they're not worried about that at the time. They're in the moment, in the present, you know, not concerned about, okay, uh, tomorrow I have nothing to eat. If, if they're eating a piece of fruit right then, they are 
in the moment, enjoying it, taking it in. And I think that's a lesson that all of us can learn. And, um, you know, it's definitely something that I took back with me. And, you know, sometimes I forget and I will be reminded by, you know, these pictures and, and the people that I met along the way when I was there. Um, this, this project, this exhibit is part of a larger project that I am currently working on. I've been working on it for a while. Um, it's, it's just recently crystallized and I, and I have some sort of direction in what I'm going to do. And basically it is, I want to capture the culture throughout the Caribbean. Um, it's disappearing, you know. It's very much westernized already, but there's still pockets of, you know, original culture that you can still find, and I just want to sort of capture it, preserve it while I can. And there's so many misconceptions about the Caribbean. Um, a lot of people tend to, to lump them all together. But, I mean, there there's so many differences, and there's a lot of uniqueness from one country to the next. Uh, you know, you have Spanish Caribbean, you have British Caribbean, Dutch, French, you know, and each, and each one has their own flavor, their own spice, and, and, I, and I really just want to sort of capture it and, and show uh, people what it, what it is really like, and again, to preserve the culture um, there. 